У меня сегодня в гостях международно признанный спикер, автор, преподаватель, психотерапевт. Более того, личный психоаналитик Майка Тайсона, невероятная Мерлин Мюррей. Domestic violences. You yourself went through a tremendous trauma at the age of eight. eight. Was sexual abuse? Keep remembering, just because something is quote normal, because we've done it for centuries, does not make it okay. Приветствую, друзья, я Тимур Баламбетов. Добро пожаловать на мой канал. Очень-очень всегда рад вас здесь видеть. Сегодня у нас с вами уникальная, возможно, необыкновенный гость. Это такая удача. Просто когда я э, получил подтверждение того, что моя гостья все-таки придет на интервью, я, конечно, был невероятно рад, удивлен и рад, что у вас будет возможность сегодня с ней, я могу сказать, пообщаться, послушать ее. У меня сегодня в гостях э, международно признанный спикер, автор, преподаватель, теоретик, психотерапевт, одна из первопроходцев в области работы с глубокими травмами и автор собственного метода. Более того, личный психоаналитик Майка Тайсона, невероятная Мерлин Мюррей. Мерлин, welcome. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It is so, so good to see you. Before we begin, let me just tell our viewers. Друзья, наше интервью сегодня будет на английском языке, но для вашего удобства мы подготовили субтитры. Просто в правом углу нажмите на кнопку CC и субтитры и включите их, чтобы понимать, о чем мы сегодня говорим. Надеюсь, что все легко получится и вы получите удовольствие от нашего разговора. Once again, Marilyn, thank you for accepting the invitation, agreeing to talk to me today and to uh, my viewers. Welcome oh, to the show. It's a pleasure for me to be here. And welcome to Kazakhstan, of course. Of course, if I'm not mistaken, this is your first time first visiting time. us. I've been trying to get here for 20 years, so for I'm delighted 20. to finally make it. <laughs> wow, wow. Well, yeah, welcome. I hope that, uh, I know that you're on a mission, but I hope that you will also get to see the city, maybe see the mountains, yes. uh, meet some Hopefully. people. To do that today, later today. And about the mission, uh, let me ask you, what brings you to Kazakhstan? Uh, uh, I was brought here by uh, some close friends and colleagues uh, to do a presentation uh, for people who have studied in my Murray method and, and uh, especially to meet some new instructors that we have here that I haven't that I've been hearing about but uh, I hadn't met yet. And so uh, I'm I'm here working. Uh, but at the same time, I do have some other friends here that I'm enjoying seeing. Mm, that's wonderful. If I'm not mistaken, you have been practicing for about, for over 50 years? For 40. 40, 40 years, 40 yes. years. It's starting in 1981. Yes, yeah. I read your book, uh, the, <laughs> the first, first book, book the first that one. you wrote, uh, Prisoner of, uh, Prisoner of Another, of Another War. War. Yes. I couldn't put it down. Uh -huh. I, I tell you, it's been a while that I have read something and you know, the entire book in two days or three oh, days. Really? And yeah. It was quite like that. My wife was like, we have things to do, put down the book. <laughs> 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 but I couldn't because it was so raw, honest, painful, truthful, healing, restoring in so many different ways. And thank you so much for your uh, transparency and how fragile you were when you were describing yeah. what you went through. Yeah. I think it has... It was difficult to write, definitely difficult. I cannot imagine. Reading it was like getting your skin peeled, but going through it and then trying to express it. Um, from what I gathered, it started for you with a very traumatic experience that you didn't even remember about. No. And no. That's how you came on this journey so many years ago. And now, years later, you're helping others. You've developed your own method. Uh, I, I want to ask, what is essentially the Murray method? <laughs> and um, uh, it's difficult to describe in just a short sentence or two. Uh, it's what I call a guideline for living. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a basic theory on uh, how to understand why people do what they do. And then it's also, uh, I've developed many instruments, about 20 some separate instruments uh, that you can use, uh, that you can use personally, or a therapist can use with their clients to help you uh, come through uh, painful incidents, and, and uh, not only from your past but today. And uh, so it's it's both. It's a theory and it's a treatment method. Uh, but uh, 
<clears throat> one of the, there's several things that the method is based on. And one of them is that I believe that every person is valuable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, and uh, having worked uh, in the former USSR since I started in Kiev, Ukraine in 2001, uh, and in Moscow in 2002, I know that people raised uh, in the former USSR, which would include Kazakhstan, Correct. Uh, that, uh, that it was always the state that counted first, <laughs> and uh, that the individual didn't have primary worth at all. And so uh, this one is to help you understand that I, I personally believe God chose to make each person and that alone gives you value. The mm -hmm. fact that God chose to make you gives you value. So having love and respect of each individual person, uh, also valuing your own health, the fact that, that nobody can make you healthy but you. <laughs> and that we're created physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. And those four things uh, are like strands that create a cord that is you. And it's important to take care of all of those. And I know that for many people, especially in the United States, they're used to taking care of their physical health, hmm. but they ignore the emotional or perhaps also the spiritual uh, health too. And uh, so it's looking at all four of those, loving and respecting yourself, other people, but also a loving and respecting and having a spiritual component in your life, which I call God. Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, it can be their higher power or Allah. Uh, and uh, But that's also very important. So love and respect of God, your higher power, Allah, others, and yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those, uh, and then also another thing uh, where the theory comes in is I believe that every person is the person you're created to be and that every person has a pool of pain of some degree and intensity. Nobody's had a perfect life, ever. That is true. <laughs> yeah. And so, well, we live in a very fallen world where there's lots of trauma, you know, like A today. broken world, yeah. Yeah, a very broken world. I mean, there's wars going on uh, very close to us. And uh, uh, so there's COVID. We all just have been going through COVID. So things like that, that you, over which you have no control, that create pain. Uh, but also, we're created, fortunately, with an innate defense mechanism. Everybody has one, and that's what helps you survive. And so part of what I've studied over the years is how different people uh, and what makes them choose different defense mechanisms. Is it their personality? Is it, you know, what, what is it? But we have defense mechanisms. Some uh, is when we... Uh, learn to uh, get things that anesthetize us. So when you're a kid, it's p maybe pizza you know, or food. Uh, and then uh, nowadays kids, it, for them, it's video games or, mm. or TV or their cell phones or uh, what, what are the things that, that, uh, that when you are, especially substances, if it's food, as you get older, it might be alcohol, mm. drugs, but then there's things that are diversionary tactics like, like sports. Uh, school, um, as you get older, sex, you know, money, power, work, uh, but all of those things that keep you so busy, well, like codependency. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's a biggie so, for us. A big, big one. And so you're so busy taking care of everybody else there, you don't mm -hmm. have time to look at mm -hmm. what's here. Mm -hmm. So, but the combination of those three, who you're created to be, your pool of pain, and your defense, then, uh, in my opinion, um, how those interact, determines everything you do in your life. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that is not something that you can actually discuss and get through in a little conversation <laughs> that we're going to have, short conversation <laughs> that we're going to have today, but I will attempt. <laughs> okay. Because my desire is also for our viewers to be able to get at least some information or even a start, uh, you know, get to the start of the process. Um, you yourself, as I said, went through a tremendous trauma at the end, at the age of Eight, 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 if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken, it was sexual abuse. Um, and that is something that you found out later on in life because it has been blocked in your, your memory. Um, as you found out, as you went through that painful process of restoration later, you talked about the, the child, the, the original child, yes. so, uh -huh. so called, yes. and the, uh -huh. there were others as well, right? Well, the, your original child is the, the person you're created to be. 
that right. I just mentioned. Right. And then your perfect image. Yes. Well, it, yes. It's who God designed you to be. Mm. Everybody is very unique. There's nobody else with your DNA but you. <laughs> okay. And then this pool of pain that I just mentioned, I call my sobbing child. Sobbing uh, child. Yes. Uh, or, and. Uh, that the one that carries your pain and then this defense mechanism is your controlling child the one that controls and and tries to defend and make sure that you you stay alive that you survive mm -hmm. and how those interact if they are healthy then we come what I call a healthy balance person and the, the balance 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 <laughs> so important uh, but then there are times when they interact in an unhealthy manner mm. and create aggression and passive aggression. Uh, and so uh, as I've learned since I've been here, and also I just came from Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we did a, a level two there uh, with like 50 people. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but I was hearing stories of how common in Central Asia domestic violence is and uh, that, that the whole area of aggression, violence, mm -hmm. and all this is definitely an issue here. So that's when these, these parts interact in a, inappropriately. Are we talking about multiple identity disorder here? Is it no, dissociative no, 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 identity? No, no. Or is it no, completely no, no, different? No. Totally different, yeah, okay. nothing to do with that okay. at all. Uh, see, multiplicity is on a continuum, and so, uh, like everybody is has everybody ha has these three components. Mm. That's the way you're designed. <laughs> you're designed to to be the person you were created to be. You're also de designed to have a defense mechanism. Yeah, uh, and everybody experiences pain. Mm -hmm. Everybody just does. Mm -hmm. So those those are they're not separate identities or anything. It's just this is your original child. And then you've experienced pain, and then you have a defense that helps you with it. That's, that's just very simple. But for people who have had extreme trauma, extreme trauma, how their defense, how their controlling child defends with that, then can, and that, that goes, that's way too complex for us to talk about here. But eventually from, uh, you know, it's, it's rare, but it definitely happens that there are people then that, that it splits and then they become a multiple personality, which is, that's called in America, and I think it's called a dissociative identity, identity disorder. disorder. Yes, but anyway, that's like way down the continuum here. Mm -hmm. And my, when I wrote my master's thesis uh, on, on this whole thing, which I called the Sendo syndrome, Sendo is a Latin word for split, uh, I, I explain that whole continuum then, but but that's not necessary to you know uh, for people to understand what we're talking about. You I don't see. need to worry about that. Thank you for <laughs> clarifying that. Yes. Uh, I guess uh, in your personal story, the way you even started to uh, tap into that trauma that happened years prior to was the physical manifestation yes. of your emotional trauma. Yes. Is that how it begins for many people? Or was it, well, and I'm glad you brought that up because um, how we respond to trauma is different for everybody mm -hmm. and depending on many things, your personality type, your culture, you know, your, what's going on uh, you know, uh, surrounding you at the time and, and uh, your age, all of those things make a difference. Uh, but <clears throat> for me, uh, when I just like to go back a minute to the when my uh, abuse happened, I, I was eight at the time, and I came out of a very conservative community. <laughs> it was probably similar to so Kazakhstan. So close <laughs> yes, to where yeah, you are right now. Very, <laughs> yes, very much. Uh, and uh, to where in my family, uh, no one talked about pain at all or dealt with. And I have a family that had lots of trauma, uh, which I wasn't even aware of. It was never discussed. And so. Uh, one of the things that, that I talk about is how your brain is created. Uh, and the, your, your brain, the way it's made, uh, is that, that, that you respond to things that are common and familiar to you. You have children. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, 
Can I segue into something uh, else before I answer Absolutely. your question? Do you Absolutely. mind? Absolutely. Okay, because I'll be referring back to this later. It's what I call your baseline for normal. Because when you're a child, what's common and familiar, you regard it as normal. Mm -hmm. And then if it's normal, you think it must be okay because you don't know anything else. You don't have any other options. And, and so this forms your baseline for normal. And, uh, and over the years, then depending on many things and your experiences, your travel, et cetera, your baseline for normal enlarges. And here you are now as an adult. And so you look back and when I'm working with clients or when we're teaching our Murray Method classes, I have them, I said, look back at what your original baseline was and see the things that are good you want to keep. You know, there's some things and traditions and all that you really value and you want to keep that. But then there's some things that maybe uh, you've already realized were not healthy, uh, i.e. Uh, like abuse issues <laughs> or alcoholism. And maybe that if you had started those, you've decided, no, I need to be sober from those. So some of the obvious things you've already eliminated. But then for me, one of the most difficult things in my therapy was when my therapist challenged me that there were some things in my baseline that because they were tradition, they were cultural, that, but maybe they weren't all that healthy, <laughs> you know, i.e. like codependency. Yeah, and of course we're oblivious to those things because no. they're, like you said, the, we grow no up with them. Yeah, they're no and Everyone <laughs> grows up with them in our little community, so we're like, it's fine. Well, well and everybody is doing this. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, so anyway, part of what I challenge people on is to be honest and open enough to look at the things that that even though the culture says this is okay, that maybe this is, isn't really healthy uh -huh. and, and that they need to change. And so that, uh, like when just the, the, the time that we spent in, uh, in Bishkek and we were in Ishakul uh, there, and then what I did here just a couple of nights ago is challenging people to look at those, especially the traditions and things in culture, uh, like, like stealing, uh, ride stealing, you know, things like that, and domestic violence that is accepted as well, you know, uh, and that we We don't even have movies that romanticize that. Oh, I know. They, they I turn know. into a comedy, something silly and funny oh. and part of our history oh, that we love and still practice. Oh, they have a Georgian restaurant in Moscow, you know, named after that, the movie. Mimino. No, no, not Mimino. No, Kafkaskaya Plain. Yeah, da, da, da. Yes. yeah. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but th those kind of things. And so, uh, it's, so if we look at what creates your baseline for normal, uh, number one, it's your family of origin, it's your extended family, it's your culture, mm. it's your ethnicity, it's your race, it's your gender, um, it's the era and time in which you lived, i.e., like I'm 86, almost 86, so I was born in 1936 in, in America during what they call the Great Depression. Yes. So that greatly influenced my, my family. Uh, so if, like I was raised uh, as a kid in the 40s and 50s, very different than somebody raised in the 80s or the 90s. Or now. Okay, yeah, yeah, or now, yes. Also geographically, different if you were born in Almaty versus Moscow. Mm. <laughs> and so, or Sakhalin, uh, all, all very different, or, or America. Uh, and then also your education uh, and and then your, your experiences, especially travel experiences, have you had the opportunity to meet uh, people from other cultures, other countries, other nationalities? Because that has the capacity to broaden. Absolutely, yeah. it changes your baseline. That you say, ah, oh, uh, this is normal enough for other people. You know, you know that they have, their normal is different from mine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, all of all of those things, your friends, and nowadays media. Oh my word! Just think. I mean, look at what you're doing. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, th the media helps change people's baseline as in both directions. Both directions, good. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point. Your right. baseline can be good and bad. Yes. And so, uh, so consequently, though, what happens? The way your brain works is that, i.e., if you're a child. Uh, and like, for instance, I was an only child. And so uh, I had, m and my parents were never abusive. They were very gentle with me. So I'd never, ever known violence. 
ever. And this was 1944, so it was pre-TV. I'd never seen violence. Mm. <laughs> you know? And so uh, I, the, uh, the worst violence I'd ever seen was a, a you know, a cowboy movie. Oh, those good old days. <laughs> yeah, you know, they're, they're, they're having a barroom fight, you know, something like that. But so I didn't know anything. And of course, sex was not ever mentioned in the whole country mm -hmm. in 1944 mm -hmm. and certainly not in my home. My mother was very conservative. So when that happened, there was no place in my baseline for normal in my brain to put that event. And so the way your brain is made, when, there, when there's not a, it's like a little pocket or slot right. to put it, you end up having to put it in a box and stick it in a corner over there someplace because it doesn't fit here right. anywhere. But I'm familiar. It, no, but it doesn't go away and it leaks out at times. Like I don't have time here to go into, but I could list, oh, a half a dozen of, of things that were like, triggers for me when these certain things happened it would be I would get a reaction that I didn't know why I'm getting a reaction from it and then also uh, for me it triggered back then in 19 in the 40s uh, well for a long time worldwide they have not understood what we call the mind-body connection yes yeah of why a physical pro uh, an emotional problem can cause a physiological reaction and they, they didn't understand that at all. So I started getting sick right away and having really violent nightmares, which my mother remembered really well. And asthma. Yeah, and asthma, yes. And uh, uh, anyway, uh, so with the, the nightmares and getting sick, you know, I was getting physiological reactions uh, to that, but, but never knew the cause. Hmm. And then as the years went by, uh, I, I had, was raised in Kansas, which is right in the middle of the state, uh, but then I moved when I was 17, right out of high school, to Arizona, uh, to a town that uh, was was in the mountains and better uh, air for uh, asthma. And uh, I felt so much better, I never went back to Kansas. <laughs> so I, I remained in, in Arizona, and uh, my family and all of, was raised there. Uh, but, uh, but over the years, my physical health just kept getting worse and worse. And but had no idea why yeah. <laughs> and I went to many many doctors and they just said we can't figure out what's wrong with you you just you have to learn to live with the pain oh my goodness yeah and it was really bad and so by the time I was 44 by then I was um, uh, business wise I had become very successful I'd started and uh, uh, co-started a uh, an art gallery mm -hmm. And by the time I was in my late 30s, I was one of the best known female art dealers in the United States, very successful. Had a beautiful big home, hmm. and everybody that saw me thought you know, that my life was perfect. She's got it all together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it looked, it looked really good on the mm -hmm. surface, and I kept this smile on my face. And, uh, but I also was very active in my church. I played the piano three, three services every Sunday, had Bible studies in my home. You know, it was doing, I uh, helped start a women's support group, one of the first in the country. And uh, so was doing many, many, many things for other people all the time. Kept yourself busy. <laughs> oh, very, uh, I, like I was getting three and four hours sleep a night. Oh my goodness. Because I was working such long hours, because I was running a multi-million dollar business, taking care of my family, doing all this ministry. And it was crazy. <laughs> I look back on it now and go, oh my, I don't know how I survived. Uh, hmm. But I came to a point of really breaking point uh, to where I was just getting suicidal because I couldn't get away from the pain. And wow. fortunately, I had a friend uh, who referred me. And back then, people didn't go to therapy unless you were cra literally psychotic. You're talking about end of the 70s, if I'm yes, not mistaken. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, early the 80s. 70s, and, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. And, Unless you were psychotic, you just didn't go to therapy. It's very familiar to what our society it's feels like about going to a counselor or a psychologist. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I often, the work that I've done here has been very deja vu mm. because it's so, <laughs> yeah, it's so, yeah, been there, done that. I do understand this. Well, and I was just like this, you know, when she suggested you go to therapy, I'm going like, no way, no way, no way. And, uh, so nothing wrong with my mind, I'm mm -hmm. just fine. 
<laughs> like I'm running this big business and doing all this, nothing wrong. And so she just kept pushing me. And, and fortunately, uh, because had she not insisted, I absolutely would have died at age 44, hmm. absolutely. And so the doctor said I was probably, later said uh, I was probably hours or days away from a massive heart attack or a stroke. Because you can't hold down you know, uh, it was not only my sexual abuse, but 40 some years of never dealing ever with any conflict or negative issue. Just, mm. you know, everything was pushed down. And you can't just do that like that forever. Mm -hmm. It's, there, there will be some release sometime. And so, uh, anyway, I, I did a very intensive therapy, which <laughs> I talk about in this book. Very uh, intensive. Very intensive. And long also. Long, long, long therapy. Uh, but it changed my life. Mm. Yeah, and uh, all of my physical problems went away. They've never returned. Uh, I, I don't ever get a headache <laughs> anymore. And like in 40 years, I'm 42 years now, I've never had the flu, flu ever. Uh, I've had the, a cold twice. And, that, and I just don't get sick. Yeah, you know, and so uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm 86. Do I look 86? You do not look 86. <laughs> I, I've been meaning to say that several times, as you mentioned your age, because I mean, of yeah. course not. Yeah, you know, I travel, you travel the, the world. world. You teach yeah. others. Yes, you help, I travel the world. Help others get healing. I, I intend to be 105. I, I, I Amen think, to that. Yes, we're going to arrange a very big 105th birthday party, which you should come and film. I will do that. <laughs> Gladly. Uh, yeah, any, anyhow. Uh, so, yeah, back to my question. So it absolutely can manifest physically exactly. when you go through such yes, uh, yes. an emotional trauma. But does it only have to be that uh, no, heavy no, of no, a trauma? No, 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 no. It can be uh, any time that you don't, process, uh, the way we're designed is that when an incident happens, it's painful. If it, it happens, if you can process the feelings, the emotions uh, at the time appropriately with somebody that is uh, empathetic and understanding and that can hear me share this, then it goes on out. Hmm. It doesn't, but when, when nobody is there or I don't know how, how to process and it's all emotions. bottled up yes and inside. it's all bottled up and you're pushing it down then you, then you have a uh, you know then you have a reaction and uh many times it's physiological uh but other times then what happens to other people is they they you know pour some alcohol <laughs> some drugs anesthetize some, uh, yeah, the pain uh, yes to anesthetize it and i i didn't do that i did the diversionary tactics of of work and taking yes. care of other people. And, but, but other people use, and it's like pouring water through a sieve. No matter how much you do, it's never, never enough. But it's such an acceptable way for the society. Yeah. You're doing so much good. You're busy, you're successful. You have your family to, that you're taking care of. You have this ministry, you're helping yeah, other yeah, women. You get lots of pats on the back for, for doing the right. And the society enables you to cope that way. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly. That is so, so like us. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, d definitely. Is, I, I have to ask you, if someone, as we're speaking, um, feels like this is about them, this is something that they're going through, why do certain instances, situations make me so uncomfortable? Why do I get these flashes yes. when I hear this? When someone the touches trigger. me it's a what certain we call a trigger. trigger. Yeah. When someone touches me a certain way, rubs me or the wrong way, says or, something, or, or I'm in a tight some, space, or, or they see even something on TV, or right. they see a movie that is so that, true. That, that sees something. Right, can, right. It's not, trigger, not even happening be. in reality, but it triggers yeah. you. Trigger something. From what the past. would they do? Where would they begin? Well, uh, I know that fortunately in Kazakhstan now and in many of your cities, you do have good therapists. And so I always say, please, please uh, be open to that. Also, they can read a book like mine, <laughs> not only Prisoner of Another War, but I have a book called The Murray Method mm -hmm. that I know now is available and we'll, we'll, we'll have some information a little later on. Mm -hmm. on uh, and then we have my Murray Method classes. Uh, which would give information on, but those are very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all ways that are things that can help people at least get started on the path of healing. 
And one of the things that I do want to mention that I was asked uh, yesterday when I, someone else was interviewing me, they, they said, what would you say in just a couple of words that you feel going forward? Uh, and I said, there's hope for healing now. Mm -hmm. And use the word hope. <laughs> and uh, uh, in Russia, is that vir? Надежда. No, no, no. Oh, vir is faith. Faith. Right. <laughs> faith. That's okay. correct. <laughs> okay. Uh, but hope for healing is greater today than ever since the beginning of time. Mm. See, for instance, had I been born in 1836 instead of 1936, I'd have died at age 44. Or I wouldn't even live to be 44. And, uh, and just think, we're still all alive. We, COVID has happened. It didn't completely wipe out the world. <laughs> <laughs> we're in the Thank past. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But in the past, it could have. It could so, have. Yeah. Absolutely. And so have. we have things, uh, you know, we, we have things like, uh, uh, my word, look at you that you're, you're broadcasting throughout the world and you can share a, a message of hope and healing that had never happened before. Mm. So I, I have very positive uh, aspect towards the future because uh, we have that available. Mm -hmm. And the fact that here in Kazakhstan, I mean, like I said, it's, it's maybe 40 years behind what happened there, but the fact that we have uh, here in Kazakhstan people like you and like Maxime and, and different ones who are are bringing hope and healing uh, to many populations now that never would have had it in the past. So mm -hmm. that's great. Just so that I don't forget, let me just tell our viewers that we are, I am going to have a link uh, and a contact person in the description of this video if you want to find help, if you're looking for someone who can explain or guide you through this, through this process, please uh, hit the description button and you'll have all the contacts there as well as the information about uh, Marilyn's books. Uh, like we said before, uh, some people are afraid to look for help because you said they feel like they're sick, they're, it's, a, it's a weakness, it's, it's considered yeah. well, a weakness. Well, it doesn't go in their baseline. Absolutely. <laughs> and one of the happens. famous clients that you had, who is absolutely from that type of a background, is of course Mike Tyson. You've met him a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, he even uh, traveled to see you in Russia. Yeah, I, for two, I, stayed two weeks with me in yeah, Moscow. Uh, I read about <laughs> Moscow that. was never the same after Mike was there. <laughs> and he called you mom. Yes, calls me mom. Calls mm -hmm. you mom. Mm -hmm. It's amazing for, you, because you know, his, his public persona is um, is drawn is created in a way that you feel like this person doesn't is not really affectionate. He's not uh, he, oh, in touch with his feelings. Yeah. He is so aggressive and all that. But you mentioned to actually break through the walls that he obviously had. How did that uh, friendship happen? Well, uh, Mike came uh, was uh, was referred to me. Um, Many years ago, in fact, I was trying to think. It was in the uh, in the late '90s, uh, and uh, uh, and he was had been in prison, and uh, uh, they uh, demanded that he uh, seek counseling regarding anger management. Mm -hmm. And I don't know whether you remember from my uh, my book that you had read that I used to work in a yes. prison, and uh, not only in the prison, mm -hmm. but with. Sex offenders. Sex offenders. Yes, I worked with uh, rapists and child molesters. At the time, that was in the early 80s, I was told I was the first person who was a, a rape victim to work as a therapist with convicted sex mm. offenders. And so I did that uh, part-time pro bono. I didn't get paid for it uh, for eight years. And so I wasn't afraid of big, scary men. <laughs> and so. Big, scary, angry men. <laughs> men yes. Yeah. And so, uh, anyway, uh, in Mike's book called The Undisputed Truth, and also that documentary uh, called The Knockout. You know, yeah, I watched that. Yes. Uh, uh, he uh, he talked to, talks a lot in his book about, you know, our relationship. And so. At first, as he said, he thought I was just this sort of old lady, the old white lady <laughs> that he could easily manipulate. <laughs> and, uh, and scare off, maybe? <laughs> yes. And so, uh, but it turned out we ended up with a, a very uh, impacting, uh, helpful, mm. um, therapeutic relationship for quite a long time. And, uh, but we worked on his baseline for normal. 
and I use that term, he, he talks about it in his book, uh, and the fact that his baseline for normal was, he wasn't sure who his father was, was never around. His mother was, loved him, but she was very alcoholic, and when she would get drunk, she would be really violent and mm -hmm. really hard on him. And so he knew violence, he knew alcoholism, and he said that she would, uh, especially on weekends, go out and, and be drinking and get some man who would come home with her, they'd have sex. He said sometimes they, he was you know, even observing that. And then the man would almost always beat her up. So he, uh, and he's also, uh, you know, Mike is not really very big. He's not super, very tall. And he said he was really small as a child and he had a lisp. So he got bullied constantly. He said at school, and in the streets, everywhere. Uh, and uh, he said they lived in a very violent neighborhood. And so he said there was no safe place ever. No safe place at school, nothing on the streets, nothing in the apartment building, not at home. And so his baseline for normal was, uh, uh, was violence, uh, alcohol, sex, women being treated poorly, no safe place, you know, bullying, uh, all of that. That's his baseline. And his image of a man. Yes, And yes. what a man should be. Yeah, was, yeah, and so consequently, he said that, and what we, we worked on was the fact that he said, I always wanted a home that was safe. And he said, I wanted to have a wife and children and, you know, be able to have, a, a quote, what would be a healthy, normal life. And he said, eventually, he was able to do that. After he became champion, had money, all that, he met a very lovely woman, I know her well. Uh, her name is Monica Turner, and she's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, s several children. The children even went to a Christian school. <laughs> you know, and, and he lived in a beautiful home. He said, uh, so I was up here having everything I'd ever wanted. But he said, what would happen in the middle of the night, some nights I'd wake up and think, but I don't belong here. This oh. doesn't feel normal. And so he said, I sneak out, get in my car, drive down to where there was a bar, you know, drink, get drunk, get in a fight, beat somebody up, pick up some woman, have sex with her, and that was normal. But he said, as soon as I would, then I would feel terrible about it. I feel really guilty, feel really bad, go back up, try to build this up again. But what we did when he was sharing this, we charted his whole life, and his whole life had been that. He'd get up here, get where, where he really wanted, but it wouldn't, wasn't his baseline for normal. And he'd sabotage himself and go back down. And so what we did, we worked on trying to keep him up here long enough to have this be his new baseline for normal. And so that's what we worked on a lot. Wow. And so when I started then to Russia, I said, you know, I can't be your therapist anymore because <laughs> I'm living, you know, most of the time in Russia, I, I for the first 11 years, uh, I basically lived in Russia and visited the States. I was there January, February, May, June, July, September, October. Wow. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so um, he and so he said to me, he said, you know, I can get plenty of other therapists, but mm -hmm. he said I really need a mom. Mm -hmm. His mother uh, died uh, when he was 16. 16. Yes. I read, yeah. Yeah, and uh, his sister uh, died when he uh, of alcoholism when he was 23, I believe, or 24. And so um, I, I said and so we ended up with that kind of relationship. And so uh, while as long as he he lived in the same city I did in the states, so when I was there, I saw him a lot. Uh, but then eventually I was, you know, spending more time here and then he eventually moved and uh, uh, moved out of state. And so uh, over the years, in these past years, I haven't seen him as much. He calls mm -hmm. me and we, we Zoom call, that <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, but uh, that, that was, was very interesting on, on the, how the baseline for normal uh, impacted his life. And that is, as you are you know, I'm getting shivers as you were talking about this because this is a reality for so many but Kazakh men. Yes. Because they they don't know that what they're living is not normal, is not healthy. Because it's, it's not always healthy. been like that. Yeah. It, it's it's normal for them, but 
keep remembering just because something is quote normal does not make it healthy. We have to keep remembering that. Big that letters. We tend to use the word normal as being okay and it's not. So it's understanding that just because it's tradition, it's normal, you know, this is what we, our culture says you know, is okay because we've done it for centuries, does not make it okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so it's looking at what is healthy and, and can be okay, but what are the things that even though it's traditional culture, i.e. being a domestic violence, kidnapping, brides, all of those things, sex, uh, have, you know, sexually abusing children, or just abusing children, period. Right. And not just abuse, but neglect, deprivation, neglect. Those are just as uh, one of the things. I, can I segue just a minute on that? Absolutely. Uh, all the years that I've been uh, in Russia, I started there uh, to teach uh, all kinds of health professionals, doctors, psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, drug, drug counselors, therapists, and clergy from many, many different uh, uh, confessions. Churches, yeah. Yes, and uh, all. And so, uh, including Muslim, uh, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, uh, many, many, many backgrounds. I, I've had Muslim imams in my class. Wow. And so... Uh, we but, gotta send a couple towards your way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, good, good. <laughs> yeah, and in fact, in America, I have many, many Jewish rabbis uh, and uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish clients mm -hmm. there, uh, and so, uh, but, but the the whole, the whole thing is uh, that that if if this if what is considered normalna <laughs> normal is not not challenged and, and looked at, then uh, you end up with uh, you know centuries of people. Uh, doing abusive things and thinking it's okay. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, th this whole this this whole whole comment though, uh, what I, I almost got sidetracked here within Russia, uh, what I found was this, uh, was when I first went there, I went there to teach uh, one week on trauma uh, to a group that was learning how to treat addictions. And they just said, you know, many people are teaching us how to work with addiction, but nobody's helping us with trauma. Hmm. And they said, you know, we have so much from 70 years of the Soviet system, you know, uh, deaths from World War II. Ooh, walking uh, trauma. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, everybody, everybody had someone go to gulag or be killed under Stalin, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, you know, please help us with this. And so over the years, I've heard Literally, I've personally taught oh three to four thousand people, personally, a and then my I have instructors who've taught many, many more. But uh, they said because in my classes people share things they've never ever told before. So I've had a very unique experience that I've been told that probably there's nobody else that has heard the stories that mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. over the years. So I'm very, very aware of what was normalna during right. Soviet, Soviet times, and uh, how. And but one of the big things that was very important is that when the Soviet system fell, and they were able, at least for a while, a lot of archives were open. A lot of them are closed now, but they were for a while. They went and they they researched and found like the original documents that when the revol after the revolution happened. When uh, when the Bolsheviks started to take over, and they had their you know their Supreme Council meetings, some of the things that they discussed, and they said the most important thing for them was the revolution, and com and to make the whole country committed to the revolution, and so they said what are the things that would keep people from that, and they came up with two things: God and the family, hmm. and they said then we have to make sure that those are eliminated out of people's lives. So as we know what they did with, you know, God, Absolutely, it was they yes. destroyed churches, killed, you know, uh, priests, priests, pastors, yeah. rabbis, you know, uh, imams, all of that. Uh, we know about that. But what they did with the family was much more subtle. 
and that I could talk to you for hours and hours and hours on. I think one of the examples that our viewers know, you know, if they remember the Soviet Union, if they're a little older, you're talking about what they did to family, they would, you know, create stories about a little boy who would betray his yeah. father yes. oh, just, yes. you know, of for course. the sake of the country exactly. and the, you know, the, the, the socialism country. and everything. Well, the, the state was always more important. Yes. Yeah, and uh, they were taught that, uh, you know, Lenin was their grandfather and Stalin was their father. And I've, many, I've heard many, many stories about that. But the whole point was they even had books, uh, which I've seen uh, for women, in, in which they taught them about parenting. And they said, your job is to produce Soviet citizens. And that, and that would say, tell them literally not to um, to uh, love and care and what we would term nurture that child because that would make the child attached to you and you want that child to be attached to the, the Soviet state. system. Yeah. Yes, plus they didn't want the mom to become attached mm -hmm. to the child. Uh, and so consequently, then parents were taught to just see this child as an object, which I'm training to be a good Soviet citizen. But, the, but a relationship isn't happening. Yes. And so consequently, now we have, we have you know, millions of people raised by moms or grandmothers who raise moms who are raising us the same, even though the Soviet system's been gone right, for right. 31 years. Right, but traditionally, <laughs> yeah. but they don't even know why they're doing it. No, but because it's the baseline for normal. Oh my goodness, yeah. this is, yeah. this is so, <laughs> scary, but good that we're okay, talking about it. but I could talk hours and hours and hours mm. on this because, in fact, this class that we just did, uh, this level two class in Bishkek, um, one of the instruments I do is what I call a, a tape, the tapes. It's the tapes that you hear playing consciously and unconsciously in your mind uh, that, like, for instance, uh, the culture that I was raised in, what will other people think? Right. Image, image, image. That's, image, that's image. Yeah. No, that, I'm sorry, that's not American, that's ours. Yeah. Uh, image, <laughs> image, image. You know, you have to make sure that, yes. that you don't do anything that will bring shame to the family. Mm -hmm. Huge, huge. Also, for me, I was raised that, that God uh, is always first, others people second, and you is always last. It's Yah's the last letter in the alphabet. Mm -hmm. you know, which, which they were taught also yeah. during the Soviet system. So those are the tapes that continue to play, even though now you're trying to do things differently, but at an unconscious level, that still plays. And so part of what we do is literally, we're, we know now how the brain works about how to shut off an old tape, but it has to be replaced with a new one. And so what we always do is ask, okay, if, if you were, as an adult, a child came to you playing this tape, we have the answers for other people, you know, but not necessarily for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if you had God and you as healthy parents with this child, what would you say to this child? <laughs> and how would you redo that tape? Right. So, but, but when we did that tape exercise, invariably, uh, especially with in all the countries in the former USSR, I've had students from all of the, the countries, and uh, that the ones about mom not being there, and absent mom, not not just absent dad. The absent dad was pretty obvious, you know, yes. because uh, oftentimes alcoholic. That was our base for normal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was alcoholic and all, mm -hmm. and et cetera. But most people haven't realized how much the lack of a healthy uh, relationship with a mom uh, was so powerful. And it, it just it comes up uh, over and over and over. And so uh, I think to, for, for people today, young people like you, you have children. How old are your children? He's only 10 months old. Uh, 10 months <laughs> old, okay. Uh, but to have healthy moms and dads of knowing what it's like to have a relationship, uh, you know, with with your spouse, relationship with your child, how to have a relationship with yourself, you know, and to and to with God in your life. And uh, one of the and I'm segueing a little bit, but um, the English word you speak English so well for nurture, okay, and and 
there is not a word in Russian for nurture. They use vaspatanya, yes. which means basically to, to educate, to raise up, to train. Because we're all just raising soldiers. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like a, a, a grapevine <laughs> that, that you have to trim and train. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, I had been in Russia maybe 10 years before I didn't know that the word for nurture didn't exist. So while you're speaking even, your translator is saying vaspatanya. Yeah, and it wasn't until one of my, I had a new translator. And she stopped me and she said, we don't have a word for that. And I went, really? <laughs> I've been here 10 years. May I ask you to explain in your own words for our viewers what nurture, nurturing is, yeah, well, as you understand it. Yeah, you know, what we did in this last class, uh, one of the students uh, may, uh, did a whiteboard and I think put like six or eight words to define uh, what we would say is nurture. Uh, nurture is a loving relationship. Uh, so there's a relationship, and so it's, it's, uh, it goes beyond just love. It, it also contains vaspatanya. So it's like vaspatanya, but done with love, mm -hmm. and done in a way that you're, it's not just this is an object that you're training. Or not only caring, right? No, yeah. It's not only caring no, no, for your it's, child. Yeah, yeah it's, it's you're, you're helping a child learn how to to grow, to function in the world, but it's done with love. It's done with love and tenderness and gentleness and caring. And presence. Yes, and, and, and yeah, because you have to have a relationship. That there's attention uh, with that, all of those things. And so uh, we were just teaching them a new word. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you for that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a biggie, but, it's a but very it's, important Well, word. it's very interesting because uh, what happened, I started, uh, when I was in Krasnodar, oh man, a long time ago, uh, maybe 15, 18 years ago, one of the uh, class members was a young man and he came and he said, I think you'd find this interesting. He brought me an old Soviet dictionary and it was a military dictionary. And he said, look at this. And he showed me the word for compassion was, ca the definition was cowardice. The word for <laughs> hmm. negotiation uh, our compromise was weakness. Hmm. And so anyway, I got really interested in that. So I started trying to find, going to bookstores, their old section and buying old dictionaries. I think I have seven or eight now. And so I started a dictionary project and I had several of my Russian friends spend time, I gave them this long list of names, mother, father, family, God, you know, <laughs> nurture, you know, all of these kind of compassion. And they went through those dictionaries. And, and we, we have a chart and it shows that during Soviet times, especially in the 20s and 30s and all, those were just absent. Mother mm. was Mat, a river in Russia, <laughs> literally. Right. And then they finally in Gorbachev's time started to come back in. But it, so the whole thing, what was missing is as important as what was done that was obviously abusive. Mm. And fast forward to our times, you know, the Soviet Union has been around for so many years now, but we still have that residual effect of everything that's been installed into our systems. Well, yeah, it's because it was the baseline for normal, especially yes. on parenting. Yes, Parent. and on top of that now, we as a um, very conservative society, we, where do I start this? So we uh, have been shocked as a nation by so many instances of child abuse, child molestation, of sexual abuse towards women. Uh, it, it's, it happens, the, the news that we hear makes it happen, make it, makes it seem like it happens every day. Because yeah. weekly we hear horrible, horrible reports about that. And, and think it, of how many you don't hear. It, exactly, how many are covered up in our culture where you're not supposed to talk about those things, which is familiar to you oh, from yes. your background. You are not supposed to talk about how your husband hits you, beats you. You're not to, supposed to talk about how your mother-in-law abuses you and treats you as a slave. You are just supposed to serve your family. That's what you were created for. That is your only worth as a woman and bringing um, children into you this world. Well. Because we've made our women responsible to raise the nation uh, to, you know, make Kazakhs 
a, a huge vast nation in this world and we have completely destroyed, erased the, the value, the worth of a woman in our society in so many instances. I'm not going to say everyone and everywhere, but th that is something that we're dealing with. And my question, my fear, my hope is we're that, that we are going to start on the journey of restoring, going back to healthy, but how <laughs> do we do that when the society says no? You don't deal with that, you don't talk about that, you just, you know, suck it up. Okay, well one of the things that, uh, uh, that you say is, is it working well? Of course not. <laughs> yeah. We have if, if so many well. young women that are married with children that are suicidal. Oh yeah. Because you That's cannot true. handle it, you no, can't live no, like that. No. You weren't created for this type of life. No, yeah, and so I think it's, a lot of times people don't change till they hurt bad enough they have to change. Mm. And so I hope that Kazakhstan is getting to the point where they realize that the way we've been working, our baseline for normal, really isn't working well. Mm -hmm. it's, if you, I mean, Kazakhstan is one of the largest countries in the world. <laughs> it really yeah, the, is. the territory, yes. Yeah, I mean, literally. <laughs> Not the population, yeah, but literally. yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you have right now, in fact, I get almost tearful thinking about it. Uh, you have an opportunity, a very unique opportunity in time, I think, that God is putting you all as a country in a place to really be a great positive influence in the world if you choose to do so. Uh, and so I, I, I'm, I'm excited to be here and to know that there are people like you and others that I've met here that are recognizing that uh, you know we have that opportunity, but we, we've got some problems that we need to correct. And so um, that's, to me, the very first thing you have to do is recognize I've got a problem. Hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and I think what you are doing is amazing in the fact that through your blog and your, your videos is that you are, uh, it's like where I was back in the early 80s, it was like I was shaking the cage and saying, hey, everybody, this stuff we, goes we've got on. got a problem. Yeah, yeah, this is really happening. Yes. Uh, but also one of the things that I found was, uh, is that you don't rattle the cage unless you can say, okay, here's the problem, but you also have to say, here's an answer. Because to me, it's unethical to rattle the cage and tell everybody, oh, yeah, all this garbage is happening. Without a solution. <laughs> but without solution. Yeah. But the wonderful thing is, that what we can say today is we do know solutions. And, and I know solutions that, that I did 40 years ago in the States. I know solutions that I've been working on in Russia, uh, you know, in the other countries, the former USSR, for 20 years. And I know thousands of people and families there that have changed in the midst of a lot of protest from the culture that says, no, you need to stay this way. Uh, that that I can tell you many, 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 many people uh, who, whose lives have changed, their families have changed, everything. Uh, and, but over a great protest, uh, there's one of the- Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah hey, one of the things that we do is that uh, in, in our level two class that we just did in, in Bishkek, is I have them, we do a, put <laughs> big wallpaper on the wall and we put the positives and the negatives of staying a victim, mm -hmm. the positive and neg negatives of being a victimizer, positive and negatives of being codependent, the positive of being a healthy, balanced person, but the price you have to pay to be that. And the thing is, the price you pay will be lots of times a loss of relationships. Because Separation, yeah. family members will say, you know, how dare you change this? This has been our culture for centuries. We have to continue this. I literally just watched that happen. Yeah. And a friend's family just yeah. watched that happen. And so they realize that they pay a, a heavy price and that's very painful. And it's what I call it gets worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. you know, but mm -hmm. it does get better if you can allow, you know, and this is where to me God comes in that you have to realize that you're not alone, that God is here with you. He wants you to be healthy. Mm -hmm. You were created to be healthy. You know, and, and that then you can come out. And I know for me, had I not changed, I would absolutely died at age 44. 
I would have had the biggest funeral our town had ever had. <laughs> <laughs> they would have been standing up saying, what a wonderful self-sacrificing person I was. Mm -hmm. You know, and that I never said no to anybody, always had an open door. And isn't it a shame God took her home so early? You know, but within a year, people wouldn't have remembered I existed. That is also true. But because I was willing to to in, you know, experience lots of, uh, I had, as you know from my book, a lot of negative re reactions. It was a battle. Yeah, it was a very, and back then we didn't have other books or other mm -hmm. thing. I was kind of, I was a pioneer in it. Uh, but, you know, now I have healthy children, healthy grandchildren, healthy, I have seven great grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I look at them with, I get tearful because I know they, they would not exist had I not changed. Mm. And because my grandchildren, because my daughters were 18 and 21 when I did my therapy. And I apologized profusely to them and said, if I had to do over again, I would have done this, I would have done that. And I said, please do it differently with your children. And they did. And so my grandchildren then were raised healthy so the people they married then were different than they than the who they would have married before, mm. and so my great grandchildren would not exist had I not changed. So I can assure everybody that it is absolutely worth whatever pain and whatever flack you get uh, from people about it because of the legacy that you will leave. And and you, I I think also you you're going to physically live longer and certainly enjoy. You're a great example of that. <laughs> and enjoy life. You know, that doesn't mean that garbage still doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Like I just, I went through cancer recently. And, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's left me with some atrophy in my feet and hands. And, and so I'm, I, I kind of walk a little wobbly. Mm. Uh, but some of those things still, you know, still happen. I just had my shoulder replaced and uh, various things like that. But but uh, energy-wise and general health-wise, yeah, I'm going to be 105. <laughs> and the clarity of mind and just how vibrant your spirit is oh, is unbelievable. You. And I think that was totally worth it. Well, and Although also one difficult. of the things that I didn't mention, um, too, is um, that I always say God can take a bad thing and make a good thing come from it, always. And... Um, I, I forgot to mention that one of the reasons people always ask, oh, why did you, why Russia, why did I make the commitment to Soviet stay? Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah to, you know, uh, there and with Soviet Union in general was because my, my father's family is from there. Uh, my grandparents were born in small villages near Saratov on the Volga. Mm -hmm. I've been there four or five times uh, to both villages and uh, done lots of research on my family. I found the documents, held them in my hand, that showed that my grandparents have lived there since 1757. 1757. Wow. So, uh, and I had a map, I stood on the very spot where my grand generations of grandparents were born and died. And so it was very powerful uh, time for me uh, uh, to know that, that I belong there. And then I had cousins, uh, uh, who came from Siberia to visit me in Moscow. Wow. They were 80 and 83. And uh, my nephew, Tim, uh, who is uh, here uh, with me now, and he and his wife uh, have lived in Krasnodar for a long time mm. and, uh, uh, and have worked in Russia as long as I have. They live in St. Petersburg now. Uh, but anyway, he came and was there with me. And uh, so we spent 12 hours with uh, these relatives. Uh, with them telling us what happened to our family. Mm -hmm. And every member of my grandparents' family that stayed in Russia, so sisters, brothers, you know, aunts, uncles, cousins, all of them either uh, were killed outright under Stalin, starved to death, or the ones that stayed alive, like them, they went to Gulag. And they went to Gulag when they were 17 and 20. Oh, and so gosh. that was like listening to the Holocaust of your own family. And, but what, how God has used that, because I have that, in fact, their children came to 
uh, we did my uh, a big 80th birthday party for me in Moskva, and so my cousins also came for that. Mm -hmm. So I was able to introduce them to all my students and say, see, I am r Russian, my family is here. Uh, but uh, because I have that kind of background, then and when I when I start every class here, I always say, <laughs> and, and I tell them about my family, and no one ever in 20 years has ever said you wouldn't understand to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I get tearful when I talk about it, because uh, Russians typically are very suspicious, and I imagine Cossacks are too. Uh, and so, um, and they don't trust anybody, especially from the West or from America. But because I can say, you know, I am half Russian. This is what my family endured. Uh, I'm, I've been accepted there, and no one has ever, ever given me a bad time. Mm. And so that's been, uh, and it's interesting when I'm on the street, I get stopped three or four times a day, people thinking I'm Russian. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, directions. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and so, uh, but it makes me really deeply grieve uh, with this situation that's happening with Ukraine right now. Oh, yes. Yeah, and uh, the fact that uh, because, see, I have been in, I've been living, uh, you know, like I said, uh, regularly in Russia since 2002 up until 2018. And then when COVID happened, of course, I missed those two years. And so this year, I was ready to go back. I, I had my schedule already done. I had my visa ready to go when the war hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I was strongly advised not to be there. And so I was just broken hearted uh, about not being able to go. And I had planned to come to Kazakhstan mm -hmm. <laughs> with uh, Roman Popov. Uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, Roman said to me, well, you know, if we can't go to Russia, at least we can go to Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Thank you for doing that. Thank <laughs> you for doing that. We really appreciate that. And I know and I hope that this is only the beginning and we will <laughs> see you more often. Before we go, because we are running out of time and I know you got other plans as well. I just wanted to ask uh, for practical advice because you teach on uh, codependency a lot. Yes. <laughs> that is a theme for us here. You know, codependency with your spouse, your husband, your children, your mother-in-law, your, your society, uh, your abusers, basically. What are some pra practical steps uh, okay. if a person wants to break Okay, I'm glad you said that. that. Uh, first, what I want to say is my definition of that. Codependency is when I do something for somebody else that they should be doing and could themselves. Be, yes, and could are capable of doing for themselves. Okay, number two, when I do something for somebody else that enables them to stay dysfunctional hmm. or enables them to stay an addict. And underline the word enable, I'm an enabler. Okay, and then number three, when I do something for somebody else, I'm so busy taking care of them, I'm ignoring my own health. See, and I did all three of those. So if you, anybody that's listening is doing those three things, then they've got a big problem. <laughs> and keep knowing that when you do those things for somebody else, you don't help them. <laughs> that's the whole point. You're Please not, repeat that again. Yeah, that is so important. Yeah. <laughs> when you're doing these things for other people that they should be doing for themselves and are capable of, you enable them to stay dysfunctional. You, you keep them uh, dependent children. And uh, and see, if we go back, I'm going to go back just a minute to the Soviet system. See, the Soviet system, I remember, uh, like in one of my first classes, a doctor stood up, big guy, and he said the Soviet system deliberately kept us as dependent children. They told us when to sit, stand, walk, talk, think. And he said, and what happened? He said, we were punished if we did anything uh, independently or even thought thought yeah exactly uh, had any uh, any individual thought uh, or tried to be uh, uh, responsible or creative at all and he said what happened then when the soviet system fell 
we were like kittens, three-year-olds, that somebody threw out in the snow and said, here, go take care of yourself. Be free. Yeah. Enjoy your freedoms. He, yes. <laughs> and and he, here, he went like this with his fist, and he went, we are not stupid. We are not lazy. We just don't know how. And he said, please show us. He said, we don't know how to be good husbands, how to be good wives, mm. how to be good mothers, how to be good fathers, how to be an employer, an employee. We don't know how. And so I think we need to go back to the whole thing on codependency of realizing that when you are codependent, you keep other people as three-year-olds who are dependent upon you. And it's not okay uh, because it's, you're just, you're continuing the, the whole thing that the Soviet system set up, they set it up as the baseline for normal that everybody is to be this way. So of course codependency fits into that. Uh, and so, but you see, the Soviet system didn't work well. It did not, yeah. it collapsed. Well, and you, you leave people as, as, as children. And you stop them from growing also. At, you well, the whole thing, they can't yeah. grow. And so I know, if you know from my, my book, I had this, uh, the, I mentioned that I'd help start support groups for women. Yes. And I had a group of eight women. And when I wrote my book, my uh, editor interviewed every, my family and everyone, and they interviewed, he interviewed this group. And afterwards, he told me that, he said, Marilyn, they told me that Marilyn was the pole and we all revolved around her. Oh. And they said, she wasn't, uh, she wasn't uh, a dictator, she was our mom, and she took care of us. So when she went to therapy and, and then was no longer the pole, we all fell apart. Mm. And they said, we were 40 and 50 year old professional women, very capable you know, women. <laughs> we, were, we weren't incapable, but we were, uh, you know, we were waiting for her to come back and be the pole again. In other words, that was a codependent relationship. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, but they said when she came back and refused to be the pole, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we were really angry. Of course, yeah, but the system stopped working. Yes, yes. It's, you know, our mom is not taking care of us. But but when the, I wrote the book was ten years later. Yes. So when he was interviewing them, it was ten years later, and he said, and he told me about this, and he said, they said we realize now, ten years later, that was the very best thing, because we all were emotional five-year-olds dependent upon her, and we were perfectly capable of taking care of ourselves. But as long as she did it for us. We let her. There's no necessity. Yeah. So yeah. how do you practically break out of well, this? Well, but that, the whole point was they said now we see we're glad that she did that. Not only was it better for her health, mm. but we grew up. But, but at the time, we were mad. And so I think it has to be for the person who's codependent to realize that what they're doing is not healthy. Mm -hmm. it, is not, it is not only not healthy for them, but they are not helping this other person. Even though they think that, or that's been their culture, you're not helping them. Yeah, everything inside you is screaming, what are you doing? You're supposed to be doing this for yeah, them, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, and so, uh, so when you realize that it's, it's very unhealthy for both you and for them, mm. uh, it, uh, but also realize, yeah, you're going to get some flack. There's some people are going to be unhappy. A knuckle, and I say a knuckle a lot. <laughs> uh, however, uh, I can assure you that many, many times that I certainly have in my life, you'll find that people later will tell you, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad that you did that, and I apologize, I was wrong, you know, and I needed to grow up, and I just, I wasn't ready to do that, you know, mm. before. So uh, I really want to encourage everybody to, uh, to do that, and, you know, to read my book, to uh, take advantage of some of the, the uh, the people and uh, the resources that we're going to tell you about uh, in our, our classes and, and follow-up groups and all that'll help with that. And I thank you. I think what you're doing is amazing. No, thank you. Uh, I'm really, I'm very proud of you and I will uh, hope that we have connections in the future because this is, this is very exciting for me to, I, I don't want to come to a place like this and sort of shake things up 
and leave with no, not, well, I wouldn't, would not. I, uh, I never will go to a place like that and if I don't know that there's someone to do follow up when right. I leave. Right. I don't want to leave bleeding bodies behind <laughs> me. Uh, you so, have a trauma, now live with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so it'll be exciting to hear what you do in the future and I hope we uh, connect. I would love to, to talk to you again. Likewise, and thank you so much for agreeing for this incredible time this pleasure, this honor, and we definitely, definitely hope, we all hope that you will come back and more people will be able to attend your training when you speak, when you're in Kazakhstan. We will also share some contacts in the description and uh, yeah, thank you so much for everything you brought to uh, Kazakhstan because you. it is a lot and it is something that we need right now, desperately. Well, it, it's a beautiful, wonderful country and uh, I think what God has planned for you is going to be way beyond what you realize, but it, it needs to be healthy. And so uh, what you're doing and the role model that you're making uh, for that is, is going to be amazing. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank, Thank you for you. your kindness. Друзья, спасибо большое за то, что вы были с нами. Я очень надеюсь, что наш разговор э, чем-то вас зацепил, возможно, навел на какие-то мысли. Если все-таки вам кажется, что что-то у вас в подкорке происходит, а вы не можете разобраться, забегайте в э, описание под видео, там будут очень полезные ссылки. Прочтите книгу Мэрилин. Я думаю, что она и не только первая, но и все остальные вам помогут. Если будут вопросы, пишите их в комментариях. Меня зовут Тимур Баламбетов. Спасибо за то, что вы были с нами. Пока.